why did it almost cost my sanity? Because uh, there was so much material to find and so much material obscured. Um, for instance, there was a file in The Hague. Uh, there was only a, an empty folder with a small note that the file was taken in 1970. Nobody knew where the file was. Uh, I, for one, thought it's it's a file of the military, so there should be a copy somewhere. And I right. found a copy. And then you discover why the file had gone missing, because there were some details in the file that the elements didn't want to be public somehow. Funny thing that, that struck me is that uh, where we find the most known tales is also the region where we have the most archaeological finds of Celtic origin. Uh, you, in, in roughly you have two kind of theories. You have the gnome as a spirit creature and you have the gnome as a flesh and blood creature, the, the pygmy theory. Right. And those are uh, the dactyli. Mm -hmm. They are a part of the pygmy theory. Um, what Eldermans mostly reported are uh, the gnomes from the spirit theory. They always appeared in a haze and they disappeared in a haze. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 32 of the Spirit Box. Today we welcome Wilmar Tal to discuss his work on the No Manuscript and uh, the original source materials creator J.H.W. Eldermans. Now the No Manuscript and its subsequent follow-up books, the No Grimoire and No Compendium, are all from Troy Books. The last two are due for publication, but the No Manuscript itself is available on the Troy Books website, the links for which you can find below in the show notes. And they're all based on... J.H.W. Elderman's work uh, concerning gnomes and contain the most remarkable art. If you're looking at this podcast on YouTube, you'll see some of that art and I really suggest you do. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. Um, so in the show, we discuss the elusive and complicated figure that is Elderman's. We discuss the importance of stories, place and community, basically belonging, um, in our lives. In relation to gnomes, Wilmer proposes some interesting ideas of where the myth uh, and, and, and stories around gnomes may have originated. Um, he notes that their previ the previous lands of Celtic tribes seem to have a higher density of these stories. Um, Wilmer also reveals uh, an unexpected origin myth for, for the gnomes, which I will leave you to have a listen yourselves. Um, in the Plus show, we discuss... What was it Elements was trying to achieve with the book? We discussed his engagement with, with um, the local people he recorded the stories from. And the secret grimoire that uh, Elements penned, covering a remarkable array of occult subjects. There's a kind of a dark sexual component to Elements' work. And we talk what his view of magic was and what is needed to practice it. So lots to see there. If you want to listen to the Plus show... Um, Check out the links to the Patreon below and subscribe and all that content and all the previous plus shows and extra content that I do weekly is all there for you to enjoy and peruse at your leisure. Right, that's enough. Let's crack on with the show. Martel, you're very welcome to the Spirit Box. Thank you very much. One of the the supporters of the podcast uh, reached out to me and recommended uh, your work to me, and I had a look at your page on Troy Books and and a, a flick through me some really beautiful books um, as a whole. They're to be a fantastic publisher. Um, and I had a look through kind of the kind of introduction to the story about kind of how you found the the, the manuscript at Bowes Castle, um, the Museum of Witchcraft down in Cornwall, and and really kind of how this whole thing unfolded. And then kind of following you online and, and doing a bit of research, uh, finding a bit about a, a bit more about this figure, um, Eldermans. Uh, yeah. How was how was that pronunciation? 
Was it okay? No, it's, it comes it, it comes close. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. That's a win. And and um, just a really un- interesting tale of where this kind of like kind of just modern day. Um, well, it's not that modern, but like you know, just remarkable pieces come from. So, could you take us through just the story of it coming into your life, and then talk a little bit about the the, the, the manuscript itself? Well, it started when I graduated university. It was back in 2004. And I had the desire to uh, write a book. But every time when I started about a subject, it kind of quit, quit out of itself. It, it, it never developed into something more than 30 pages. And in 2012, I came across a story uh, here on the Veluwe where I uh, have a vacation home. And it, it was a strange story. It was a story about uh, an, an owner of a house who uh, also had this elite occult society that was uh, abusing and sacrificing children. And I started digging in a little deeper and I suddenly realized that a lot of the stories couldn't be true because the, the timelines weren't uh corresponding and there were things being said about this person that were yeah, absolutely not true uh, uh the descriptions of his house that weren't uh, accurate and i started digging in a little deeper and deeper and then i came across the name eldermans mr eldermans was one of the researchers uh connected to people who were actually going into this story and yeah to know something more about mr eldermans i had to uh, contact his family so i uh, discovered that he had a granddaughter uh, who was living in france i contacted her and she was impressed with the the book i wrote about the subject eventually and she asked me if i wanted wanted to write a book about her grandfather well having met eldermans shortly in uh, that research tra- uh, trajectory, I was kind of thinking, well, he's an interesting fellow. Why not? And that was actually when I opened a large can of worms. <laughs> uh, it became a quest of uh, a couple of years, uh, which almost uh, cost me my sanity, but eventually it resulted in the silent listener. And yeah, why did it almost cost my sanity? Because uh, there was so much material to find and so much material obscured. Um, For instance, there was a file in The Hague. Uh, There was only an empty folder with a small note that the file was taken in 1970. Nobody knew where the file was. Uh, I or one thought it's it's a file of the military so there should be a copy somewhere and i right. found the copy and then you discover why the file had gone missing because there were some details in the file that elements didn't want to be public somehow um and he, he was very uh skilled in, in in making himself disappear from from historic record and that made it a hard investigation, but eventually I think I nailed it. <laughs> cool. He was uh, secretive. Uh, he told stories about people that were absolutely not true uh, about himself, that he was a, uh, a, a police officer, that he was uh, high in the chain of command at the, the Ministry of Justice uh that he was uh, a lieutenant in the dutch army that he was uh, an an expert on the occult with the dutch police and and people believed him he had the power uh, and 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 he he could convince people that what he told them was true um eventually it was kind of a demythologizing uh, uh, elements uh, uh, in, 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 in his work. But the fact that he still uh, left so much work 
behind uh, is something to admire. Right. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's quite hard to grasp. It, it, it's very double. Uh, on one hand, he is a person who can lie easily. On the other hand, he is also someone who can devote himself to a task and really uh, make it work. Uh, really, uh, let, let such a collection grow because we, we, we believe that there were tens of thousands of pages of work of him left and uh, those are now all dispersed across Europe and some of these pages are destroyed. Uh, we don't know why, but we can guess. It, 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 it's very complicated. Okay. And the, the, the no manuscript uh, that we discovered in the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic made things simpler because here you have one subject uh, where he was kind of an expert in and you can finally make categories in that, uh, like uh, he was uh, interested in their culture, in their origins. He was interested in their clothes, in their shoes, in their tools, uh, the, the, how, the way how they migrated uh, from Ireland to Norway. Uh, he, he, he made maps uh, of, of, of those migration routes. And, oh, wow. uh, there, there we actually get some of the essence of his personality. And I'm currently thinking of a book about his views on sexual magic. And that's another aspect of his personality mm -hmm. where we can zoom in on Elderman's himself. Was he a practicing magician then? No. But no, I'm, I'm, conv I'm convinced of that, that he was not a practicing magician. Uh, because for a practicing magician, I would have expected much more uh, notes on rituals, on, on, right. on uh, garments, on, on tools to use, uh, mm -hmm. on uh, ingredients to use for uh, whatever he wanted to do. And, and those notes are uh, yeah, missing from his work. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at his sources, they are mostly uh, the popular witchcraft books from the 1970s okay so because I, I remember kind of in and to that point talking about witchcraft books because because brooms come up again and again in in in, in the manuscript yeah yeah but there's no real explanation as to why the strangest brooms yeah really the strangest brooms the brooms i've never seen before but he makes them he i, I think he invents them mm -hmm. So in, in, in terms of understanding the the book, with the level of detail in there, it, you know, actually, before I go to that, how did it end up at Bo's Castle? Well, uh, Mr. Elderman's passed away in 1985, uh, March 17th. And he had promised his son-in-law, who was also very interested in the occult, that he could have uh, a portion of that collection of him and uh, Bob Richel as his son-in-law was uh, called uh, came to uh, The Hague took that part that was uh, promised to him uh, back to Amsterdam and uh, he, yeah he started categorizing all those uh, drawings into black magic in uh, sexual magic in uh, sadomasochistic sexual magic all, all, all these different categories he started to uh, bring together in folders and in boxes and uh, some of those drawings he sold on the auctions other parts that he was very keen of he kept and eventually uh, bob was thinking uh, to sell that collection to a collector in amsterdam uh, that failed uh, then he was kind of looking for uh, someone who could uh, take care of his collection when he was gone. And he came across the Museum of Witchcraft in the notes of his father-in-law. Okay. There was this uh, constant re mentioning of Cecil Williamson and his Museum of Witchcraft in Boscastle. So Bob was uh, visiting his... Uh, the, the boyfriend of his cousin uh, and he had 
internet in those days. And he said, from, well, Bob, let's just sit behind the computer and look it up. Mm -hmm. So they found a phone number and they called and they asked if they could have an address where they could send some of the materials. And they sent a letter to uh, the museum in, in, in first, uh, it, it was addressed to Cecil Williamson, but in the meantime, Graham King already had taken over the museum. And Graham was a bit skeptical because he gets a lot of these uh, people that say, from, oh, well, I have something interesting for your museum. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like, uh, well, let's see what you have. And then Bob started sending drawings over and Graham started to notice that Bob really had something substantial. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bob then visited the museum in 1998. Uh, he was in Hove visiting a friend of his daughter's. And one day they just stepped into the car and they drove to Boss Castle five hours. <laughs> um, well, he visited the museum. Uh, he, he only had an hour to go there, but uh, the, the, the visit left a positive impression with the museum staff. So uh, Bob was inviting them over to come to Amsterdam and to see his collection. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Graham did visit Bob in Amsterdam in 2000 uh, on February 7th. And he was so impressed with the, the quality of the collection that uh, they in, that, that night they uh, made the, the arrangement that the museum would be the sole heir to okay. the collection of yeah. Bob. And yeah it should go to the museum when Bob passed away and Bob passed away one month later. Wow. Okay. 16th March, 2000, uh, Bob mm. uh, died of an aneurysm. Right. And then, and then you followed it over there. Uh, the, the, the collection went to Boss Castle yeah. and the, the story didn't end there. Uh, <laughs> The, the the museum staff noticed that a lot of the pages were in Dutch and mm. you know, well, none of them spoke Dutch. So they reached out to the University of Amsterdam, uh, Professor Wouter Hanegraaf, and uh, if he could help in some way. And he decided that it would maybe a good uh, thesis subject for one of his students. So uh, one of his students went in 2003 to uh, Bos Castle for a couple of months. And she uh, made a catalog of the, uh, uh, the, the whole collection and uh, a database and a description of uh, some of these parts. And the Pagan Federation International was helping with translations uh, of the, 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 the diverse uh, pieces uh, in the collection. And yeah, as of 2018, I am also helping uh, translating. And the, the no manuscript is in fact a translation of the entire manuscript wow. uh, with commentary uh, mm -hmm. where necessary. But it's uh, the idea of the no manuscript was, uh, by the way, uh, coming from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic themselves. Okay. That. Uh, and I just picked it up and I had something mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's a great idea to catch on. So I was actually trying to write one book about it, but it was so much material mm -hmm. that we decided to split it into three. So we have one book about uh, the, the origins, habit and culture of the gnomes. The mm -hmm. second book is about the magic. And the third book is about the, the leftovers. Okay. So in, in, so in terms of the first book, in terms of the, because um, I'm interested in the origin of the of of the gnomes. Um, yeah, and, and I guess my my first question, kind of leading into that, is in terms of when we look at kind of like Northern European um, mythological beings um, or the unseen. Um, obviously, kind of from Ireland and and and. And British countries, we have the idea of fairies being quite prevalent, but of course, it's all the way across France um, uh, with with the idea, the term uh, puck and those kind of uh, figures. Um, and in the in the north and uh, Scandinavian lands, you've got like your 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 elves, your trolls, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Hulder folk in Iceland. Mm -hmm. um, where do gnomes fit in? Is it is it another name for the same thing, or is it a separate a separate uh, entity? 
type of entity rather mm, it's hard to answer that because uh when you look at the netherlands mm -hmm. uh, the most known tales uh, can be found in the south in limburg north brabant Zeeland, those provinces have mm -hmm. the most known uh, tales and most little people uh, because they're, they're not always known as gnomes uh, they have different kind of names we also call them alven we also call them Alvermannetjes, Eertmennekes, all those uh, are, are uh, different names, local names for the same phenomenon. Okay. But the most funny thing that, that struck me is that uh, where we find the most known tales is also the region where we have the most archaeological finds of Celtic origin. Yeah, right. And I'm starting to believe, I'm, I don't know for sure, it's, it's not something I have really dug into, but I'm starting to believe that the belief in little people in general, so mm -hmm. the, the elves, uh, spriggans, uh, pixies, it, it all originated with a people that lived in Central Europe and we have come to known as the Celts. Mm -hmm. And it is very well possible that the Celts uh, were, for instance, trading with the Germanic tribes. Mm -hmm. um, they influenced them with their stories and there those stories get different treatments, uh, mm -hmm. more local adjustments and start to develop into their own little people folklore. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, there are so many similarities because people uh, weren't isolated. They were always no, they were. looking yeah. up, they were trading, they were traveling. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, an, an, an important way because if, for instance, uh, in Ireland you have elves mm -hmm. and fairies. In mm -hmm. the Netherlands, we don't have them. But mm -hmm. as of short, since, uh, since, since a couple of years, we do have elves here. This cultural uh, influence, uh, it's, it's the influence of the, the, the Irish folklore and the British folklore mm -hmm. on our folklore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that's entirely possible. I think these, these, these narratives do migrate. You know, they absolutely do. The, the, the bit that gets really interesting for me is when, well, there's two things before I go into that. It's like, firstly, people actually grossly underestimate the, the how effective, like, maritime travel was you know that they, they uh -huh. all well, these things are far away they're they're distance you know they're, they're, like it's it's hard to get to you know from to ireland to to the netherlands it's hard it's hard to do it's like yeah people but, even, yeah. even travel through the bronze age yeah they weren't walking <laughs> they, they no weren't. they weren't absolutely no. not and yeah. they they managed to cross seas yeah. with yeah. those simple ships they had absolutely it, it, it's bizarre if you think about it but uh that, that's indeed one of the the, the most important uh, uh vessels of 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 uh spreading your your cultural cultural heritage uh mm -hmm. but also your beliefs uh, mm -hmm. and yeah who knows what 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 is more behind it mm -hmm. well, well one of the things i find really interesting is is kind of looking at um let's say like from the what we would call kind of be like the Arabian Peninsula and, uh -huh. and Islam that came out of that area and, and how the ideas around uh, the jinn have migrated across the Islamic world yeah. of North Africa and on into India and so, so forth so on. There's still a lot of the same taboos with jinn as there are with fairies. Some of them are almost like for mm -hmm. like. It's remarkable, like down to things like... Um, like throwing wastewater out of a home. So kind of homes who were not plumbed, homes that kind of, you know, had yeah. wells and all that kind of stuff. There's this almost an identical taboo with throwing water out of the home, dirty water out of the home, where in, in, uh, in the Arabic world, you throw it out to Bismillah to, to bless and warn, um, to warn any jinn in the area this was happening so you don't offend them you don't kind of start a um a feud with any jinn or, or and, and you don't um, want that yeah you don't <laughs> do that you don't incur the wrath um but exactly the same with the fairies almost like uh -huh. an identical 
taboo. You know, you like and then like the, the, the words in Irish are like Ishka Salak, you know, you don't throw out dirty water without warning fairies and, um, and giving some sort of like blessing to warn them to get out of the way, et cetera, et cetera, because you don't want to start um, an issue and get um, struck by the fairies. Things like traveling in wind. So the jinn are synonymous with the cinnamon wind. That's, that's where mm-hmm. kind of their, their origin comes from. The heat, the cinnamon wind is what Allah created the jinn out of. And they travel in the wind. So in, in Irish culture, you've got um, an, uh, Angihashi, which is the fairy wind. And yeah. it's how they travel. They travel through the wind. Um, and if the fairy wind hits you, touches you, you know, you, the, the, the assumption is you're, you're not along for the world. So, you know, you're, you're, you're on the way out. So it's, it's, uh-huh. it's, and there's dozens of those motifs that are the same, the same, the same. You know, and again, like that could be a trade thing. It could be. Um, or it could be different cultures talking about the same thing that some people are experiencing or that it, was it, it's, that's another explanation yeah, yeah that there was yeah. some uh, prehistoric could be uh, culture which has one basic belief and yeah that it developed from there mm-hmm. uh, that's also one of the uh, Dutch researchers uh, I don't know if you know the uh, commotion here in the Netherlands about black beat Yes, I am familiar with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. there is one researcher who is convinced that black beat is not a racist stereotype, but is in fact a uh, character of the trickster. Right. Mm-hmm. And the reason why he paints his face black is not because he wants to portray a black person, but mm-hmm. because he wants to uh, uh, obscure his face with mm-hmm. a mask of the dead. Mm-hmm. And the black, the, the trickster in this particular uh, sense is a uh, also a fertility uh, god who mm-hmm. comes around every midwinter and uh, tries to uh, smear the faces of the girls with his black skin and mm-hmm. a, a kind of midwinter fa- celebration. Right. And this, this particular researcher is convinced that this trickster character is from one culture in the past and that all european cultures have their own trickster Mm -hmm. personalities that come around in the fall uh, around halloween around uh, the midwinter fests Mm -hmm. or and i I thought it an intriguing hypothesis but there is still that uh cultural influencing uh, that's going on and Mm -hmm. I'm not certain still, but the, the, maybe when, when I'm blessed with the time, I'm going to look into that. I'm going yeah. to. Uh... Yeah, it's it's interesting. But, it's it's hard to tell. You know, it is hard to tell. I mean, like the, these themes do come up again and again. You know, and and like you look at kind of um like work like the like the Golden Bow or um, or you know the Hero uh-huh. of the Faces, and it's like we see the same themes come up again and again across culture, and it's like irrespective of where you are in the globe we still end up with the story of the hero, the story of the quest, you know. And the, what, like the, what struck me with the golden bow that you uh, just mentioned is that uh, also a lot of cultures that weren't in contact with European cultures, uh, like uh, in North America, South America, uh, or the Far East, uh, also had the same similar themes. And yeah, then you start thinking about that those ideas must be way older uh yeah maybe even originating from when man still lived in africa on the plains well that certainly those ideas were developed in a far, much earlier stage they could be you know and at that stage you could be talking about other hominids you know like uh-huh. you know uh, really really early stuff i uh, and like the north american um like the native americans uh, have loads of these stories about little people like yeah. loads, there's a huge fast kind of uh, array of, of of work well-documented work that these themes again are hugely prevalent um and again like um we know those those cultures weren't in direct contact with western europeans for a long time i mean 
you can but kind they of still had those concepts that, that those ideas so yeah. it, it, it's it is something that uh yeah, if I if I had the time, I would look into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's it's where you track it back. You know, it's it's because yeah. I don't I don't think these are European ideas. You know, I, I don't think they're European in origin. I think like they're they're prevalent. Oh, no. They're prevalent in certain areas, um, like Ireland. It re it remained quite well documented in Ireland because it had an entirely different culture to most of Western Europe. Like there was no real industrial culture in Ireland. I mean, up until like the last 50, 60 yeah. years, you know. It's, it's like, funny that you say that because I read that book, uh, The Witch by Ronald Hutton, right. in which he uh, discovered that people from areas who spoke a language of Celtic origin, mm -hmm. so like the Irish and mm -hmm. Welsh, uh, they weren't actually scared of witches, but they were scared to death by fairies mm. yeah that doesn't surprise me you know um i was joking about this like um you go to ireland now right you go to ireland now you could be out in dublin in a very metropolitan bar over, uh -huh. overpriced beer you know um and uh talk to people about fairies and they'll laugh but yeah yeah i don't believe that i don't believe that and then they'll mm -hmm. immediately caveat it with where you shouldn't piss them off. Like, it doesn't matter kind of what strata of society you're, you're in, there's still an ingrained level of taboo. You know, yeah. like, I'm from the west of Ireland, like, we don't, you just don't touch white thorn trees. Doesn't matter how modern the society around us is growing, there's still those taboos. Now, I'm sure that will degrade in time as, as, as the culture changes, but it, it's still hugely ingrained. I mean, in the 1990s, there was a, a fairy tree in County Clare where there was a road yeah. averted around it. I know the story. The story, yeah, with, with Eddie yeah. Lennon. Yeah. Um, I mean, that happens. Like there was a, a, yeah. Yeah, again, a minister in County Kerry who was blaming the quality of the roads on fairy rings, I think in the last five years. Um, I can't remember his name. It's he's, he's a kind of a, a bit of a, it's a bit of, if I'm honest, a bit of a ludicrous character. But like these things still end up um, in in the culture of the country. Um, and um, well, the more the more east we go in the Netherlands, uh, mm -hmm. we see that people still have uh, certain uh, customs and values that right. uh, in in the western part of the Netherlands they 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 laugh at them. Right. Right. But, um recently i saw an interview with someone who um he called it farmer magic and th these are all these customs that farmers still are performing in the eastern part of the netherlands just to make sure that their crops are growing that their mm -hmm. cattle is safe and healthy and it's still um something that is uh, ingrained in the people mm -hmm. over there, uh, and, and, and you can't tell them, well, it's it's rubbish. You shouldn't do that. Well, next season they still do it mm -hmm. because it is part of them. It's yeah. part of their culture, their local culture, mm -hmm. and uh, I re I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I do too. We should we should we should be be careful with uh, uh, our, our our local customs and and, and not be too hastily to throw them out the window. I agree completely. Those differences, those those kind of anchoring things to the land, yeah. to the past, and to our kind of our ancestry are, are really important, you know? And like probably a hundred years ago, or maybe not even that long ago, like those practices where, you know, they were seen as like, well, you know, I don't know what the harvest is gonna be like. So I'm going to hedge my bets. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the harvest is good. Because if it's not good, my family. But, but these customs were also binding. They were. Uh, oh. they, they brought the community together. Yeah, of course. And it is. It is something that I uh, sorely miss in modern uh, society. Mm. Uh, the, the Corona crisis, for example, it, it it only showed us how divided we are. Yeah, that's true. So people. And I, I, I start wondering where, where are the, 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 the things that bring us together? Mm -hmm. And once you start looking into to those little farming communities, those 
communities are still together because yeah it, it, it's still uh in their dna uh, for instance yeah yeah that's really cool yeah um we're still we're still looking to move over here so it, it, it it also got us, uh, the, the, the city people. Uh, we were now, uh, the, 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 if, w when I go into the forest, I, I feel so much rest in me. Mm. And I'm, I'm a skeptical guy, but I really think that the, 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 the forest is a healing force. Uh, something in there is rooting me. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah, I, I have, I mean, for, it's the same thing for me with wilderness. You know, I, I like to look over stony cliffs, yeah. mountains with clouds wrapped around them and, and look at a kind of a stormy sea. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's a settling thing for me. But, you know, you, what you're talking about the forest thing, there's a whole, the whole Japanese concept of like forest bathing, that the idea of walking yeah. into the woods and, and kind of being there and being present there is a beneficial thing. And I, 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 I get that completely. You know, uh, I think... Again, when we talk about kind of being divorced from one another, you know, where we're separated by, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of atomized modern society where we're very, very much individual, even within our own kind of small nuclear families, we're still individual as opposed to being yeah. part of a community. That, that isolation thing, while it's been kind of wrapped up as being kind of, well, I'm an individual, that individual, that individuality is a great thing. It's not always a great oh, it thing. is, but you still need people to survive. Yeah, exactly. That individual in isolation, like the flip side of that is isolation, you know, uh, and we still have to make sure that we're part of communities. You can still express yourself, but being part of a body, being part of a community, being part of a legacy, being part of a place is all good grounding stuff, you know? Um, yeah, it's... it's it's an, it's an interesting kind of facet of modern life that that disconnection from land and disconnection from community is is deteriorating people's sense of identity you know and and, and, and yeah well one 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 kind of uh, thing that gives people identity are the stories they tell and uh, mm -hmm. uh eldermans was also aware mm -hmm. that people tell them each other stories and he was very uh keen on uh, getting the stories about gnomes from people and he just was going into town he knew where to start mm -hmm. and just uh, drinking some uh, beers with uh, someone and then eventually into the night the story came from uh, well mister you you shouldn't believe me but and then the story of the gnomes came out mm -hmm. and he collected quite a few nice examples of gnome stories in a region where the, the folklorists never recorded one gnome story to begin with so it, it, it's very uh, peculiar and strange uh, so the, the region where i am now uh, there are some gnome stories but not many and the gnome stories we have there are kind of germanic in nature eh? the kuba walda the house spirit uh, which eventually was obsolete because people knew how to lock their homes to, and, and make windows and make doors so the, the the house spirit wasn't needed much anymore and the gnome lost its function mm -hmm. uh, those kind of stories are around here but when you go south the, the gnomes are getting much more celtic in nature uh, mm -hmm. uh, much more mis mischievous uh, you shouldn't spy on them because they make you blind uh, in Zeeland gnomes are known to make you lose your way uh, being pixie led that, that, that that's in in the netherlands but it is kind of a british concept mm -hmm. which kind of survives here and in a region where we find archaeological finds of celtic origin so i'm starting to connect dots here mm -hmm. it's certainly, see, uh, certainly possible um one question I'm really keen to ask you about is the origin myths. So in, 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 in yeah. the book one of the manuscript, what are the origin myths of the gnomes? Gondia. Or Crete. Oh, <laughs> Crete. Crete. Really? 
Oh, you got to yeah. tell me more. That's that sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, one, one sip of water. Um, it's a long story because on Crete there you have Mount Ida, and on Mount Ida you uh, had a people of small creatures who were known as the Idaic Dactyli, and they were miners, and they mined for ores like iron and copper, tin, and once Mount Ida was depleted, the uh, Dactyli decided that they were moving from Crete to the mainland of Europe, and they started to make their way into Germany, and they eventually ended up in a town called Ramsbeck, and Ramsbeck is known for its iron mines and its tin mines, and the Dactyli have worked there, but they kept on their own. And because they kept on their own, the local people there never really knew what kind of folk they were. And so the tales about uh, little people with magical powers came into the world. That's one of the stories. Uh, another story is, or for another origin story, is that uh, the gnomes were uh, the house spirits, the, the, the Kuba Walda. Uh, yeah. They were actually spirits of. Uh, ancestors uh, who had gone before them and who were now in the shape of small creatures guarding your home and mm -hmm. uh, protecting your home. Uh, that's one origin story. And then you have also the, 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 the Celtic stories about how they are uh, nature spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, you, in, in roughly you have two kind of theories. You have the gnome as a spirit creature and you have the gnome as a flesh and blood creature, the, the pygmy theory. Right. And those are uh, the dactyli. Mm -hmm. They are a part of the pygmy theory. Mm -hmm. um, what elements mostly reported are uh, the gnomes from the spirit theory. They always appeared in a haze and they disappeared in a haze. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you could see them clearly, sometimes you could see them not so clear or they were just a cloud somewhere between the, the trees and there is another creature in dutch folklore uh, it's called a witwief which is uh, translated white woman or okay. a white broad or a yeah. and those spirits live in mounds or in old ruins and uh, once they start crying someone in your family is about to die okay so you see the connection with the banshee yeah 100 <laughs> yeah. percent um and it's, a, but it's not known, it's not known who is going to die someone in your family yeah. is going to die and right. if yeah. you see a witweef then you have to run okay they're, they're absolutely not friendly they can uh, be friendly mm -hmm. but not most of the time no <laughs> and are, are there any other beings that are associated with the vidvif if I'm, am i pronouncing that correctly like um any other kind of no no no, no no yeah with the vidvif they mostly come in in, in alone mm -hmm. uh sometimes they come in groups mm -hmm. okay but it's very very rare that they 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 they, they congregate in groups they, they're mostly solitary uh phenomenon uh i i have to admit i have seen one okay yeah yeah the uh, what i think is what made the witte uh originate here on the failure which is actually a mist that uh, is in between the trees and once the sun shines on the trees the mist dissipates very right. quickly and I think that a lot of people have mistaken that for a bit weave mm -hmm. and that it, it's one of the reasons why we have that uh, phenomenon here very locally uh, because right. it, it's not something that is traveling uh, to the other part of the Netherlands. Uh, in, in, in the West Netherlands, they have never heard of bit weave. <laughs> so it's, it's a very... really typical, typical Eastern Netherlands uh, phenomenon. And that is just associated kind of like literally just with the natural phenomena that happen in the landscape. I think so, but there are also stories about Vitavifa that they can, um, like like a siren, lure you in. 
Okay. And they, 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 they lure you in with the promise of treasure. Mm -hmm. And mostly they give you an assignment uh, to, to unearth the treasure, uh, which is fairly impossible. Like uh, you have to dig and you cannot speak. You cannot utter one sound. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what happens. Uh, people start digging. They find the treasure chest. They try to lift it up, and the chest slips from their fingers. And what do they do? They curse, mm -hmm. and the treasure disappears for all eternity. And all those kind of kind of uh, impossible tasks uh, are are also something that is attributed to those creatures, but they are also believed to be. Uh, related to gnomes mm -hmm. because with Viva also guard treasures and gnomes are also known to guard treasures in the earth well the treasure theme is is a is a big one right you know it's the same with them uh with fairies obviously leprechauns pot of gold all that kind of stuff yeah and then with the jinn it's the idea of knowledge of al gayab you know the, the, the mm -hmm. hidden world and and then um, part of that knowledge of the hidden world is finding treasure particularly long lost treasure in runes which again is a common theme you know it's this association with these rune sites and sites of previous cultures and um, so like i mean it it's it's one of those things that when, when you unpack all of this when you start to look at all of it you know you look at kind of like like again the, the islamic idea of jinn most of those jinn particularly the big jinn like your pazuzu your lilith all those big characters uh -huh. They're they're yeah. older, they're just older gods, like they're pre-Islamic gods, right? You know, and then they they get downgraded by the dominant culture and they become evil, all that kind of stuff. Just like in in, in Europe, where you're evil in this point is a point of view. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that's like Soronos in Europe becomes uh -huh. the the horned god becomes the devil, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So similar so uh -huh. similar thing happens. Um but there's still a fascination with the older culture. And the myth, the mythos around the older culture that becomes something else. And I see a kind of cautionary tale in it, uh, like uh, don't don't try to get too rich too easily because you have to pay yeah. a price. There's always a moral. There's always a moral. Um, there's always a moral yeah, yeah. There's, there's, uh, yeah. I mean, like I've seen a, a very good tweet, uh, what kind of a long time ago on on Twitter, which was like, you know, basically you could surmise all Irish uh -huh. fairy, fairy tales with. The um, fairy says, don't do the thing. The person says, I'll do the thing. The person dies, you know, and yeah. that's really the structure of nearly almost every kind of fairy tale. It's, it's, and it's, the, the thing always has some moral, like it's more always got some moral integrity to it, you know, be it, um, you know, yeah. treasure isn't everything, be it kind of loyalty, be it kind of looking after your friends, looking after your family, whatever it is, it all, or, or, it's yep. the same thing in the Netherlands. So yeah. Don't watch the gnomes work. I watch the gnomes work. I go blind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. It is always. always um, um, is, there, is there an inspiration thing with the gnomes? Is there, uh, there certainly is with, with like, uh, again, with gin can inspire people to um, be very poetic and artistic. Um, certainly fairies. Uh, there's a real connection with kind oh, that, of musical scale, that kind of thing. That that idea is from a later date. Um, the, the elderly lady where Eldermans was talking about, uh, Mevrouw Ardi Annie Gerding, nice uh, name for English people to yeah, pronounce. I'm, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. It's, it's, it's that nasty throat. He. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but uh, Mrs. Gedding was convinced that if you were walking in the forest and you get a bright idea, that was something the gnomes have sent you. Right. And okay. um, they were in, in, in also an inspiring force. And you see this, the influence of the, the Greek muse mm. uh, spirit that uh, brings you the inspiration for a poem or a piece of music or... Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's how she saw that gnomes worked. Uh, if they wanted you to know something, they would give you a, an image mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in your mind. And uh, that, that image would evolve into an idea where you could work with. Uh, for instance, uh, if I walk in the forest and uh, I get the idea from, oh, I should look into the Celtic origins of the gnome stories. Mm -hmm. That idea comes from a gnome in her. 
In her, yeah, okay, in her. In, in her view. Yeah. I, I don't know where it comes from. I, I'm just grateful that I get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that some art from the book on your T-shirt? No. Yeah, it's art from the uh, from the uh, Richelle collection. That's pretty cool. It's a T-shirt from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, and I yeah. wanted to support them in these hard times. Mm. So I bought some textiles from them. <laughs> It's cool. the third T-shirt I've bought this year from uh, the Museum of Witchcraft. Oh, I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to have a look. I need a couple of new T-shirts. Um, well, now you can see the, the, the one. Of the, it's one of the two designs they made of the Richelle collection. That's really cool. It's nice. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Mr. Alderman was quite an artist. I have to say, looking at the, the manuscript, you're, you're absolutely right. Some of the, the, the artwork is amazing. Really, really amazing. That's stunning. Yeah. Stunning. I was actually thinking of having a tattoo mm. to commemorate the fact that I completed the whole work on the No Manuscript. And I was going through some of the drawings, but yeah. nothing actually spoke to me and then suddenly there was this one it was a round uh kind of pentacle like uh design with with small gnome feet mm -hmm. in it some symbols from uh the key of solomon right and, and uh, like a small stone jar and uh with a dagger in the design and a branch with three small uh stick with three small little branches on, on, on there in uh, according to Alderman, such a branch is uh, like uh, the, the, the symbol for uh, the male uh, if it had two a forked branch is female right in okay. his, uh, mm. and but all those things together yeah it was like uh, with, plus the the, the no papadus the the symbol you have to uh, draw on uh, the, the the letter of a white goat uh, with the blood of a man who has died in July, uh, this is a very strange ritual it is. But and you have to wear that on your heart to make sure that the gnome doesn't exert its wrath on you when you have called it to uh, find gold for you in the earth. And uh, all those things together, yeah, that was one of the things. Well. Uh, that I considered. Uh, a, 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 beautiful piece of work to have as a tattoo yeah i totally get that it's oh, a, it's, it's really i had it on my back last week <laughs> oh nice one congratulations awesome but anyway um back to back to gnomes um so one of the things that's kind of really prevalent in fairy culture and really prevalent in gin um mythos is the idea of the fall the idea of kind of like that in ireland um the fairies, they, 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 there's, they have a complex origin, right? You know, you've got the whole thing of like, there's the, they're, the Tuna de Danan, that they've faded away, mm -hmm. gone under the earth, that kind of stuff. But kind of a more yeah. prevalent myth is that they're actually the, the angels that uh, backed, backed Lucifer and they fell, they fell from heaven. Right? Mm -hmm. um, now within kind of gin lore, you have the old, the whole thing of kind of uh, Iblis, who was the, 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 the head jinn, the king of the jinn, was part of the angelic host. Not that he was an angel, because, because he had a free will, which the, angel, the angels didn't have free will. But he was uh -huh. part of the angelic host because of his kind of extraordinary intellect, and he was particularly um, uh, particular gifts that elevated his status. Um, but he refused to bow to Adam at the point of the creation of Adam. He would not bow. Okay. Um, and as a result, the jinn were cast from heaven. And that's where that's where the schism happens between humanity and the jinn and humanity and the fairies. It's very it's a very similar myth. There, there's slight differences in it. Um, but now ultimately there's an element of kind of like, well, okay, well, this is an Abrahamic faith asserting its dominance over a more animistic previous faith right you know it's just like the idea of uh, yeah. nature spirits land spirits or previous cultures so it's an it's a way of that abrahamic faith 
showing its dominance. It's going, like, okay, well, we believe all this kind of supernatural stuff, but you know what? Allah has jurisdiction over this. God has jurisdiction over this. And I was interested yeah. to kind of listen to kind of some stuff that you were talking about. Uh, and in the book, that the idea of church bells scared the gnomes away. Yeah. That was a similar thing for me. It's kind of because that's asserting Christian dominance over the supernatural again. And I In just, a way. Yeah. I just want to get your thoughts on that. Um, well, the thoughts of certain researchers in the Netherlands is that uh, gnomes are pagan creatures. Right. So they are scared of anything that's Christian. Uh, only Elderman's has uh, found some people who said, no, they're not scared. They loathe Christianity for its, uh, it, it's, its hypocrite morals. Um, they're not scared. They're not scared of church bells, but they don't want to hear them because mm -hmm. of the, the associations it brings with them. It, it's, well, if, if that is a genuine explanation, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's something Eldermas has written down, uh, which he in turn heard from someone else. It is not something, uh, a theme that comes uh, from, from, from folkloric studies that were made in the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it's not a theme that really comes back in gnome tales. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at the known tales here on the Feluwe, they are mostly, uh, or people are terrified of them. Uh, like in Arnhem, uh, we have the tale of uh, the oil, uh, the, the Oli Manneke, which is uh, the oil man. Uh, there was a mill where they uh, made oil. And the, the, the mill was driven by horses. So the, Oil men every night when the the, 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 the 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 workers left the mill, the oil man came and he worked the horses to, to to fatigue to to really to exhaustion, and when the people came back this next morning and saw the horses totally floored, uh, they were thinking, "Oh my God, the oil man was busy this night." So they called a priest who performed an exorcism, which also is very peculiar. Mm. to do with a gnome infesting a mill and the gnome was uh how, how do they say that he was condemned to uh be thrown out of the city and he could only walk one step back each year so by the time the gnome would be back at the mill the mill probably wouldn't exist anymore right then those are the kind of stories that actually emerge here. Uh, not as much that the gnome of the the oil man was scared of the priest, but the priest did indeed have some kind of jurisdiction, power, jurisdiction yeah. over the supernatural. Uh, there's also a story about someone who uh, wasn't able to uh, move his car anymore. His his horses wouldn't walk. And he started looking what, what what's the cause. And then underneath the wheels, he found the body of a small man. That was a, a gnome that, that mm. kind of hexed the car mm. uh, because the wheels rolled over it. Mm. And, and he tried, tried to stop it with mm. his magic. Um, here we don't see any jurisdiction over the supernatural, but more the opposite that the supernatural was in fact, uh, capable of making the car stop and making the horses stop. In Twente, they have stories about dwarves, not as much gnomes, but more dwarves. Mm -hmm. And if cattle see dwarves, they freak out. Okay. So if you see if you see cows galloping through the meadow, they have met a dwarf. And do, dwarves do they harm the cattle. Hmm? Are there they, stories of them hurting the cattle? Do they they physically hurt them? Oh, no, no, but cattle are just scared to death. They don't physically harm them. Um, the only creatures that are physically harmed are humans. Right, okay. And mostly because they don't uh, meet the end of the deal. Uh, there's a story about um, a, a man who every day he was uh, putting some food on a well. Mm -hmm. 
and in trade for that he got a piece of gold and the fact was that the dwarves laid a piece of gold there and then he traded it for the food one day he decided that he would take the gold but not give them food well he knew that <laughs> all his uh, seeds for uh, sowing were uh, damaged and uh, he couldn't sow anything yeah so they 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 got they got him back uh you should not pull a prank on a gnome or a dwarf or any supernatural creature over here no uh, that's that is definitely a terrible idea that's that's also an international uh featuring absolutely it absolutely is you're absolutely right absolutely Um, not mess with spirits don't do it Big warning sign. Don't yeah. do it. Well, we're going to do it. They will mess you up. Uh, yeah, uh, they will. Wilmar, I'm, I'm hugely grateful for your time. And thank you so much for telling us about your work and um, this remarkable story. Such an intriguing story. I mean, I guess like it's a, almost like it's a family story, right? You know, through multi-generations of people exploring this kind of work and expressing themselves through, through artwork. It's... it's um, been hugely interesting and i really appreciate your time well thank you for your time and uh for this interview it's uh has been a while so i had to come into it really (laughs) it's it's not not my native in and my native language so sometimes it's struggling for oh what's the translation of that word (laughs) well you've done pretty well it's it's better than my dutch yeah um so uh, i i appreciate your your time and uh what was I going to say? I was going to say, um, so the best place for people to find you is Facebook and then on Troy Books. Troy Books, www.troybooks.co.uk. And then you can find me uh, right. in the author section. And well, yeah, I, I, mm-hmm. if you're interested in the subject, just go over the website. They're amazing publishers. I'll put the links in the show notes. Yeah, that's appreciated. (laughs) Thank you for your time. Thank you, Wilmar. And that's it for the show. I'd be sure to check out the show notes to see more of Wilmar's work and some further interviews with him about the known manuscript by Troy Books. To echo Wilmar's words, it's important to support small publishers such as Troy Books as, as without them, we'd live in a world where stories like this one would never see the light of day. So it's, a, it's an important thing to do. Thank you again, Wilmar. Really appreciate your time. That's it from me. Talk soon.